Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we welcome Tom Straup, president of the Satellite Industry Association. Imagine being able to download a full-length, high-definition movie to your phone in seconds, whether you're in the car, ship, plane, in remote or rural areas. That is the potential that 5G brings. High bandwidth and seamless connectivity to end users across a range of networks from terrestrial to satellite. 5G is about connecting things everywhere, reliably, without lag, and delivering a high-quality user experience. During this episode, Tom Straup, president of the Satellite Industry Association, will discuss the market drivers, the opportunities and challenges that 5G presents for the satellite industry. Tom is uniquely qualified to discuss this topic. He is well-versed in the regulatory and policy issues of critical importance to the satellite industry, including spectrum and licensing issues, defense and public safety matters, and export control and international trade issues. Tom, we're going to jump right in here. So what do you see as the market drivers for 5G from a satellite perspective? Well, John, first of all, it's great to be here. And I'd like to touch on a a couple of the points that you made in the introduction, because I think that that really highlights the opportunity for the satellite industry. The first is high bandwidth, and the other is seamless connectivity. And we've evolved from a world where broadband connectivity has been nice to have to where it's essential to have. And I think that the three attributes that the satellite industry provides and the opportunity that is created by 5G um, are ubiquity, mobility, and security. And, of course, these are three features that satellites uh, have a great advantage relative to other systems. Ubiquity, we're really the only technology capable of providing uh, service to large portions of the Earth. With respect to mobility, we're really the only technology that can provide service to uh, airplanes, um, um, maritime vessels when they're away from, from access to terrestrial facilities. And then security, of course, when systems go down, our infrastructure is in the sky, and we have the ability to provide service to um, systems that have been that have lost coverage as a result of natural or man-made disasters. So, I think that those are three the three major drivers. Without getting into specific applications, and that's true with respect to satellite systems generally, but also especially when we're looking at deployment of five G systems. I've had technical discussions with people at 5G, and what they say is that they realized that security was an issue, and so they baked it into the system. And so this is almost like it's the fifth generation. Oh, we saw the mistakes we made two generations ago, and we're going to correct those. So a lot of this is better and improved from the early generations, isn't it? That's absolutely uh, part of the intention with each iteration of, of, of the technology is how do you improve on the prior generation? Now, Tom, the satellite industry has traditionally operated in standalone networks that haven't seamlessly connected to other networks. So how does 5G potentially change this traditional mode of operation? Yeah, I think that 5G represents an opportunity for the for a shift in the relationship between the terrestrial and the satellite communications industries. And the inclusion of satellite in 3GPP standards will help to integrate the satellite and terrestrial systems needed for the demands that are placed on the 5G networks. And so uh, we've seen standards addressing both backhaul and direct connectivity to devices. Um, So I think that we're going to see um, you know, the, the industries cooperate more because of the ability for the satellite industry to expand the coverage for broadband networks, for, for terrestrial networks, um, you know, whether it's for proliferation of, of IoT devices uh, in remote um, areas or providing coverage for devices on the move, but also being able to provide um, for the, the uh, caching close to the network's edge for, broad, uh, for backhaul purposes. I think that, again, we've seen a recognition that many of the things that are desired by 5G can only be achieved with the ubiquitous coverage that satellite networks provide. Well, Tom, we're in the Washington, D.C. area. It's mandatory. We use acronyms every 30 seconds, so i got to throw out an acronym. I'm not trying to confuse the listener because we have listeners all over the world, and here's an acronym I'm going to use here. Uh, The key innovation of the fifth-generation standard is the new 5G NR, new radio. Can you discuss the value of waveform in the industry? Yeah, so it's a new it, it, it's a new interface that's being developed for five G, and I suspect many of your listeners know an air interface is the radio frequency portion of the circuit between the mobile device and the base station. And 5G is initially being made available through improvements in LTE and, and its 
subsequent improvements. I mean, I think that there are three generations of LTE, um, but basically um, as non-standalone services. But it's going to be followed by a major step up with the new air inter- interface, which is the standalone 5G NR. And so I think that the opportunity for the satellite industry is that by deploying this waveform, they'll have access to greatly increased um, Um, market size, you know, essentially billions of devices, whether they're IoT devices or mobile phone devices. Um, And so I think it will also provide access to uh, interoperability access across networks. And this is something that's been talked about for a long time within the satellite industry. We have a number of companies that have deployed proprietary networks, and there's an advantage to that. Each of the companies has done their own R&D work. Um, They've got advantages, technical advantages that they've been able to provide, but you don't get the same kind of interoperability and access to the mass markets that we'll have with the deployment of 5G systems. So I think that that's going to be one of the major changes that we see within the satellite industry is the deployment of a standardized device, standardized networks that will be able to access all of these devices. So Tom, just, uh, you know, from a mere mortal's perspective here, the way I look at it, so LTE is a standard for 4G, and new radio is a standard for 5G. Is that the way it sets up, or am I getting it confused? The 5G systems that are being deployed today are utilizing LTE. Think of them as backward compatible. But ultimately, there's going to be a new interface that's deployed. So 5G not only has a bigger pipe, faster speed, but more devices, which fits into the whole IoT argument, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I read this figure, I don't know if it's true or not, uh, 7 billion people in the world and, and more than that number of IoT devices out there. And so there's more devices than people. So how do you manage the madness? I mean, this is the challenge today, isn't it? It is. And, and, and really, that's one of the, you know, the challenges and opportunities for 5G is to be able to create a network that's not just dealing with, you know, one access System. I mean, in many ways, it's uh, 5G is described as a network of networks, um, and so it's not just going to be traditional mobile services or or um, uh, unlicensed services, but satellite services. And again. Uh, In order to achieve the vision of 5G, we need all of those systems working together, and that's absolutely one of the challenges, being able to provide interoperable service across all those different networks. I'm quite a sophisticated person, so years ago when I heard about 5G, I went to YouTube and typed in simple description of 5G, (laughs) and there was like a cartoon description of a lot of relays, a lot of cell towers, and, and this going to there, and the car, and it was a doctor's office, and all kinds of things, so... Maybe listeners may have that idea of salt terrestrial on based, but but so let's put this in perspective of uh, satellites then. So so what unique value do satellites bring to this network in the ground? Yeah, so I think that um, the, the the key is from an end user's perspective, it is seamless extension of five G services. And so you saw a depiction, you described a depiction of you know different different networks, different means of connections. But from the end user's perspective, it's really that seamless extension, being able to access you know, the services that are provided, again, whether it's an IoT service, whether it's downloading videos, um, really it's, it's without any interruption, no matter where one might be. Um, there are some other things that um, the satellite industry is going to be able to provide. One is the quality of experience of, of high-capacity applications. And so and there's going to be an opportunity to use intelligent routing and offloading of traffic so that satellites can allow terrestrial networks in certain places to be able to um, to, to save their spectrum uh, and improve the resiliency of the network. So just beyond the the, the service directly to um, the devices that we were talking about with the seamless extension, there's the opportunity to improve the quality of service. And then the final point is something that I touched on before, and that relates to when there's a disaster. Uh, When there's some type of damage to the terrestrial portion of the network, they they can take over and allow the network to keep operating. Quality of service, that was a big term back in the early days of VOIP, and now we're talking about QoS for satellites. So I'm just thinking, you know, I'm listening to you about increased speed and reducing latency. So if I do a Zoom call with my friend Fritz in Utah, it it could drop out, but eh, not the end of the world. What if there's a doctor doing remote surgery? (laughs) All of a sudden, there's no room for latency in this one, Tom, especially if I'm the one getting sewed up or something remotely. And so more and more telemedicine, especially for veterans in rural areas, more and more doctors analyzing x-rays remotely. And so this latency, you know, this is one of the key applications, isn't it? It, it is. And, and so you, you gave an example. There are several other examples where 
you know, whether it's latency, whether it's a seamless connectivity, making sure that there's not any, any eruption to the interruption to the network connection, um, it, again, is one of the key promises of the, of the technology. You know, Tom, hundreds of thousands of people all over the world have listened to this podcast. Go to Google and type in Constellations Podcast to get to our show notes page here. You can get transcripts for all the interviews. Also, you can sign up for free email notifications for future episodes. Well, I mentioned we're in the Washington, D.C. area, so um, we got to talk about the federal government. It's everywhere. And so are there unique cases or maybe interesting use cases for 5G in the government sector? Well, absolutely. And, um, you know, we'll start with the military. You think about any of the applications that, that we've talked about have applications for the military. So, you know, just think about if you're a soldier in the field and the, be able, the ability to be able to take a feed directly from a drone to be able to see what's happening across the horizon. Um, IoT is another example, just being able to monitor um, the, the functionality of all of the different pieces of equipment. And that's true whether it's a ship, whether it's an airplane, whether it's a tank. Um, so I, I think that we're actually going to see the military as one of the major customers for 5G services. And I know that they're looking at what the potential applications are for them. And it's unusual in some respects because for a long time the military has had bespoke um, systems that have been designed specifically for their purposes. Um, I think that this is a case we're going to see, where we're going to see them taking advantage of the many capabilities of, of uh, commercially developed technology. But that's just one example for the government. Another is um, the, the, the border control. You know, almost the same scenario that I had mentioned, being able to utilize a feed from drones or use uh, IoT devices to determine whether there's an intrusion at the border. Um, same thing for emergency services. So think about it. Um, um, you, you, uh, uh, it could be in a military context. It could be in other contexts where you've got the ability to be able to provide a video feed and downloading information uh, to a hospital on the way for, for providing services. So um, there's almost an unlimited number of applications within the government. Um, some of the others, uh, um, traffic control, I think we touched on. Um, the, the application for traffic, but the ability to be able to, for, for just local governments, to be able to determine that, okay, there's a tie-up in one area and we need to divert traffic in a different way, or we need to change the sequencing of, of traffic lights. All of these are kinds of applications that will benefit from 5G. Tom, when you used the word bespoke, I thought of a lot of traditional ways that the military handles communications, and um, I'm seeing a parallel here. I see some people in the military taking advantage of the public cloud for certain applications. And so is that what may happen with the military? They may take advantage of, you said it, they're actually using commercial services because they're more flexible than their old bespoke manner. Do you see that happening too? Absolutely. And I think we're seeing it in, in a number of areas without regard to, to 5G, where they're taking advantage of commercial uh, technology. I mean, the, the U.S. military is a major customer for the commercial satellite industry. Just, you know, we are able to advance technology faster than the military has been able to do on its own. So we've definitely seen uh, them taking advantage of, of, of technology, again, developed initially for the commercial industry, but ultimately applied to them. When the historians write about 5G, they'll say that uh, I think it was first commercially released in 2019 in the United States. Uh, but let's move up till today. So how much progress has 5G deployments made with the satellites so far? Can you cite any examples? Or? Yeah, so we're going through the testing phase. So it was um, release 17 of 3GPP was released earlier this year. And so we go through the sequencing, and that uh, one of the, the, the releases that includes the satellite technology. So uh, our companies are now going through the testing process, testing the air interfaces. Um, so I'm not aware of any actual commercial deployments at this point, but again, given the, you know, the, the infrastructure that we deploy is uh, uh, in space, we need to go through extensive to test, to testing. You know, so once we know what the standard was, what the, the characteristics of the standard uh, were going to be, now we have the opportunity to build it into the networks, test it before starting to deploy it. So I would expect that sometime within the next year or two, we'll definitely see deployment of, of 5G-capable satellite systems. The people in the satellite community um, have heard about all kinds of different thoughts about uh, using satellites. And some people will say that you know, it's possible that LEO satellites can replace cell towers because your phone will go right to the low Earth orbit satellite instead of going around. So is that possible? Is that a, is that a thing? <laughs> 
Well, I think that I, I would describe it as more of a supplement than a, a replacement. Yeah, because there are, are hundreds of thousands of cell sites, and you know, despite the deployment of thousands of satellites, just the, you know we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of satellites that have been deployed. I do not ever see us having the capacity on space to be able to replace all of the cell towers that we have here, um, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere. But I think that there is an opportunity to be able to replace them uh, or, or, or actually not have to build them, I guess might be a better way to put it, where um, you have a, a rural area. It's just not economically feasible to be able to build a cell tower. And there are companies that are already starting to uh, go through the testing process, getting applications uh, filed and, and approved at the FCC to provide direct connectivity from satellite to mobile devices. And, they, and, and some of them would describe the services that they're offering as cell towers in the sky. But again, I don't see them replacing any of the, uh, the existing infrastructure uh, that exists in, in uh, major markets around the country. Tom, people who know your background know that you spent many years in the wireless industry. And uh, it seems that today the wireless industry is demanding additional RF spectrum for this 5G. So how do you see this impacting the satellite industry? So this is an ongoing point, of, I'll, I'll say, of friction between our industries. We're both growing. We both have a need for more spectrum. And um, there are instances where we're looking at how we can share spectrum. Uh, there was actually a, a spectrum band that was made available, it basically transitioned from the satellite industry, a portion of it to the, to the mobile industry. Um, but I think that we're going to continue to have to find ways that, uh, we, can both that we can both grow uh, without ca causing potential interference to each other. Or, uh, you know, there, there was an instance where uh, it was called the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding at the FCC, where spectrum that had been designated for satellite and fixed uh, fixed terrestrial use uh, was made available for mobile use. And it creates issues for the industry because when you have millions of de devices potentially coming to w within the service area of the satellite system, it can cause interference. So um, it's an area that is going to continue to be a challenge for policymakers as well as for both of our industries. You know, traditionally on the Constellations podcast, we talk about interference with satellites, not interference with, you know, down here in the ground and these terrestrial signals. But it's, it's really a problem, isn't it? It is. It, it definitely is. And again, as we start to try and share spectrum or close the, uh, you know, decrease the amount of, of um, guard bands in between different different systems, um, as we as we move to higher and higher frequencies for mobile services and satellite systems, the potential for interference exists. And there are proceedings at the FCC um, addressing whether some of these bands can be shared. Um, and it comes down to the engineering studies as to what kind of interference can be accepted, whether you need receiver standards. Um, but it's definitely an issue. And, of course, there are opportunities for companies that, um, that provide interference mitigation technology. The issue is not going away, and it's going to become an increased issue as we look at, at continued sharing of bands. Well, Tom, it's crystal ball time here. So uh, if there is a 4G... Then there's a 5G. Well, guess what? There's going to be a 6G at the next decade. I guess every decade there's a new G. So what are your thoughts on the next G, the 6G in satellites? So I think that the – I think 6G is going to be designed with satellites in mind. I mean, it is certainly it's going to be – you know, all of the things that we've talked about, that 5G is an improvement over 4G, uh, I think we can expect to see um, the same – expectation for 6G, but I think that one of the big differences is 6G is going to be designed with satellites in mind, the ability to provide um, ubiquitous coverage throughout the globe. And I think that that's probably going to be one of the big opportunities for the industry. You know, Tom, this is not the first time we've covered 5G on the Constellations podcast. If you want to delve deeper into this, you can listen to episode 100 with Stacey Kubitschek from Lockheed Martin. You probably know her. She talked about 5G, and she touched on the Air Force. Also recently, episode 130 with Bill Ray from Gartner. He talked about 5G and, and, and more about Leo. So homework for everyone listening to the podcast here. You know, Tom, I think you've done a good job in uh, helping our listeners understand some of the policy involved with 5G. I'd like to thank our guest, Tom Stroop, president of the Satellite Industry Association. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.